uh, people interested in teaching business English uh, uh, and with us uh, and sharing the session this morning. So, as you already know, I'm going to talk about um, how I get to, how we can get students to talk, uh, encouraging communication in the business English classroom. Um, I think everybody wants to talk, uh, students always want to talk, uh, but they don't always uh, have uh, the means to do so, it's for various reasons, it's not always so, so easy to express themselves in the way they would like to. Um, and um, it's, I don't know if you've ever had that experience of uh, preparing uh, what you think is going to be a, a great lesson um, and then just for some reason um, people don't seem to, to talk, uh, it doesn't, doesn't quite gel, you don't get the results you expected. Um, and I think this, uh, this quotation from Mario Cortez is, is very relevant. Um, leading the horse to water uh, isn't always enough, so your, your well-prepared lesson uh, doesn't always get things going, doesn't always get people talking, uh, if your students are not really thirsty already. So you've got to make that horse thirsty uh, and uh, really want to talk. So what I'm going to try to do today is to, to present a number of ideas and, and tips and examples um, of ways to, to get students talking. Um, and I'm also going to ask you some questions because uh, I'd like you to be, uh, to be active uh, and get involved in, in thinking about this uh, with me. Um, so here's my first question. So the most important thing for students to learn in the first lesson is A, how to introduce themselves, B, how to use the present simple and present continuous, or C, how to pass the ball to another student. Um, so as Henry explained a few moments ago, you can uh, just choose on the, the icon uh, under your name and choose A, B, C, D, uh, perhaps not D, no, no, D won't, uh, won't be uh, very useful, but okay, so we've got lots of choices coming in, and uh, for the moment we've got lots of A's, how to introduce themselves, um, we've got absolutely zero B's, which is, which is interesting, because in most course books, uh, lesson one tends to be about present simple and present continuous, uh, depending on the level. And uh, we've got uh, uh, a few num a fair number of C's. Okay, obviously, um, I'm going to give you some some answers to these these quizzes, which which would be my answer. Um, but you're very welcome to disagree with me. Uh, so I would say. Uh, for me, um, okay, yeah, introducing themselves is useful, but for me it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is learning how to pass the ball. Uh, when I say pass the ball, I don't mean literally passing a ball, although some teachers like to, to use a ball to, to toss around the classroom uh, to get to, to, pass, uh, uh, to pass on to the next student. Um, but actually using a ball um, tends to um, replace the language. So what I'm talking about is um, encouraging students to use expressions like, like this. And you, Karen, what about you? Um, what do you think? Does everyone agree? Um, this, this is a way of um, encouraging autonomy getting students used to the idea of, of talking to each other and not just talking to the teacher. Uh, probably at school, uh, when they learnt English at school, um, they probably just spoke to the teacher, maybe did some pair work, um, but probably weren't really allowed to, to speak to each other. Um, but speaking to each other uh, in our classrooms um, is a very valuable uh, resource. Uh, very valuable opportunity for communication. Um, and for example, when you're checking exercises or checking homework, um, it can make a fairly, what's sometimes a fairly boring thing to do, it can make it pretty interesting. 
you can actually have a, a little mini meeting to correct the homework uh, and the teacher can, can sit back and just facilitate and, and help and correct where necessary. So that's a, this is a good way of really increasing the amount of, of language production in, in your classroom. Get this right at the beginning of the lesson because you know the first lesson is really critical. It really sets the tone for the whole course. And if you can get people talking to each other in the first lesson, then they'll probably keep keep doing that uh, for the rest of the course. Um, I sometimes hear about hear colleagues saying, you know, well the first first lesson was a bit difficult, but after that it was okay. Um, but very rarely. Do you hear that uh, the first lesson was great, uh, but after that uh, it wasn't so good? So have a great first lesson, get everybody talking to each other, uh, and that really sets things up for the rest of the course. Um, here's my second question. Um, a good warmer or cooler takes A, a few minutes, B, half an hour, C, half the lesson. So I hope everybody will understand what I'm talking about by a warmer, a warm-up activity, um, something to, to get students talking at the beginning of the lesson, and a cooler, um, another short activity to uh, end the lesson uh, and finish with some speaking. So we've got... Yeah, we've got a very clear majority of answers for the A's. Yeah, a good warmer or cooler takes a few minutes. I would say, of course, it depends. It depends on the situation. Um, but a warmer needs to be long enough uh, to achieve the goal of warming people up. You know, coming coming in from. Uh, uh, from uh, whatever they've been doing, uh, disconnecting from work, uh, connecting to English, uh, so long enough, but not too long. Um, these things can tend to uh, to expand and take up rather a lot of time um, if you let them, um, but they shouldn't distract from the, the main objectives of the lesson. Uh, so let's have a look at some examples of warmers and coolers. This one uh, is from um, in company, in company pre-intermediate, and it's a very simple warmer, uh, a picture of a, a rather interesting hotel room, uh, and just a question, what's the best hotel you ever stayed in, and the worst? Um, and that can trigger people's anecdotes, um, uh, little stories about places they've been, where they've stayed. So. A good warmer should usually be relatively easy. Um, it's not targeting any specific um, target language. Um, it's probably introducing the, the topic of the lesson, um, and it's a way, one of the ways to, to make the horse thirsty. Um, here's another example. Um, slightly more structured, this one. Uh, it's a little quiz, how decisive are you? Uh, again, comes from in company, uh, this time from the intermediate level. Um, so students will work through that and, uh, and swap their uh, their ideas, their opinions. Um, again, something that will probably take five or ten minutes. I don't know, I don't know if you can hear my cat, who's desperate to get in the room with me, and he's scrabbling away at the door. So I'm sorry if I'm slightly distracted by that. He really does want to get involved. Um, another example, um, pictures or cartoons are, are always good for warmers. Um, as they say, a, a picture paints a thousand words. Um, this one comes from in company Upper Intermediate. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's a nice way to introduce a, a topic uh, and get people reacting. And an example of a cooler. Uh, this is a cooler activity. It's a, a, a variation on the uh, familiar uh, NASA activity, survival. Uh, this one, instead of surviving in the desert or surviving on the moon, this is surviving in the lift if the lift gets stuck. 
Uh, and this can take uh, a few minutes. Yes, you can you can hear my desperate meow in, in the background. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, Jack is, uh, as I say, really keen to get in. Um, so this is something which uh, is a nice way to, to finish off a lesson, um, especially if you've been working on something a bit more challenging where perhaps there's less language production going on. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'll, I think I'll try not to talk about the cat anymore. Um, one thing that I always do try to do when I'm planning my lessons is to start and finish with a speaking activity. So um, whatever I'm doing, um, I'll try to have those the first five or ten minutes and the last five or ten minutes um, with a, um, a, a speaking activity uh, with uh, where everybody can interact. Um, I think when, when students go away from the lesson uh, saying, yeah, today we spoke a lot, uh, that's a sign of a, a successful session. All right, so let's move on to my next question. Um, and this is one where opinions may well be uh, divided. Uh, on average, the amount of lesson time spent on the course book should be. What do you think? An average lesson. Obviously, uh, lessons are different, um, situations are different. Uh, but I'm interested just to see what sort of spread of answers we have. So, um, we've got, oh, it's pretty close uh, between A and B 25 to 50%. 50 to 75 percent. Um, nobody for C, so clearly um, everybody um, tends to think that between 75 and 100 percent would be too much. Yeah, we don't want to just do the book. So I think, yeah, I, I, I think we're all agreed on that. Um, and um, the book should be, a good book should be a springboard, of course, um, and uh, it's very important to to personalize uh, the content. Um, if we're talking about um, business English, um, then usually we we need to, to personalize um, and to relate what we're, we're talking about to the students' uh, individual objectives and context and situation. Um, obviously, a course book uh, is difficult for a course book to address every different situation. Um, so, yeah, I would I would say um, either of those. Um, I think perhaps in my own preference would be B. Um, I think if if students have been given a book, they they expect to use it, um, but it's very much as I say a springboard, a basis. Uh, for the lesson. Um, and the way I like to, to think of this is as the, the Christmas tree, a Christmas tree approach. Um, the book is, for me, is the trunk of the Christmas tree. Uh, it's the support uh, and it gives a structure and it helps students to see where we're going. But around that trunk, we can have the branches and we can go off into other interesting areas, um, more decorative than the trunk. So uh, here's a, a, an, just an example from in company uh, upper intermediate where uh, you've got a reading exercise. Uh, you can't see the actual email, but just the questions. So you've got two questions about the email, uh, and then we branch off uh, with the green, the question in green uh, to talk about your own situation uh, regarding travel and entertaining clients. So Christmas tree, book, away from the book, back to the book, away from the book. Uh, and I think that's a, a general approach that works very well. Let's go on. Um, so thinking about uh, getting back to some basics. Um, 
My next question is about oral drills. So oral drills are useful for A, dentists and 1970s EFL teachers, uh, B, students who don't have much to say, uh, C, students who want to speak more fluently. So I'll just have a little think about that. Okay, and interestingly, yeah, we have some people who think that oral drills are just for dentists and 1970s direct method uh, English teachers. Um, I was, well, I, I'm old enough uh, uh, to have started my teaching career uh, when the direct method was popular and we used to do a lot of drilling. Uh, and then the um, communicative approach came along and suddenly we thought, oh, well, maybe this isn't the way to go. Maybe we need to, to be uh, exchanging uh, our own ideas and uh, getting away from this mechanical side of the language, of language teaching. Um, and to a certain extent, I think there's, there's a risk that we've... Um, thrown the baby out with the bathwater. There's, there's been a, a move away from oral drilling. But there's a place for, for oral drills. Um, and I think that uh, they are good for students who don't have much to say. Well, it's not really that they don't have much to say, but for various reasons, uh, they, they find it difficult to express themselves uh, in a the classroom. Um, and very useful for students who want to speak more fluently. Uh, there's plenty of room for a little bit of uh, mechanical practice, but we can also make it less mechanical by bringing in a little bit of imagination, uh, a little bit of, of personal uh, experience. Um, so here's an example from uh, the business pre-intermediate um, of a couple of oral drills uh, working on uh, the past continuous uh, and the simple past. So uh, in pairs, uh, students just take turns to ask the question and answer them following the pattern, what were you doing when the alarm clock rang? Oh, I was dreaming about the fantastic job in California. What were you doing when the bus arrived? Oh, uh, I was talking to my friend. Uh, etc. So it's an oral drill, um, gets them used to the, the asking those, those questions following the pattern, uh, lets them use a little bit of imagination uh, in their answers. And then the second one turns the question around, uh, what did you do while you were waiting for the plane? Oh, I texted my friends and listened to music. If you find this a little bit too mechanical, um, you can then, as a second stage, ask students to, to close the book uh, and to ask and answer uh, their own questions or questions that they've remembered from the exercise uh, so that they're not just reading it off the page. Um, but I think this, this gives the students the opportunity to, to consolidate the uh, grammatical structure uh, and also to, to practice asking and answering their questions as fluently as possible. So this is another area where, uh, obviously, you're not going to do this all the time, uh, but a short, sharp, five-minute burst of oral drilling, uh, it's more speaking, uh, and it gets people used to, to talking to each other in English. Um, a second uh, aspect of uh, Back to Basics, uh, the information gap. So what exactly is this information gap? Is it the difference between teachers and students? Uh, the difference between gap fill exercises and conversation? Or the difference between embarrassed silence and lively pair work? So again, would you like to vote for that?
So we've got to, ah, a fair mix of answers. Um, the information gap between teachers and students, well, yes, I guess there, there can be a, a gap of information and a gap of knowledge. Um, and our goal is to try to, to bridge that gap, to reduce the gap, to share our knowledge with the students. Um, gap fill exercises in conversation, yeah, that could be another way of, of looking at uh, an information gap. But what I'm really uh, thinking about is uh, the difference between embarrassed silence and lively pair work. Um, new teachers, uh, if you if you talk about pair work, um, they will sometimes uh, get an embarrassed silence because they haven't asked the right questions or they haven't set up the right activity. Um, and uh, if you ask students to talk about their uh, opinion of uh, uh, a particular uh, phenomenon in the news, a uh, political situation, you may get absolute silence. Um, but if you set up a, an information gap activity where students have to exchange information, um, then you're much more likely to have a lively exchange. So a couple of examples. Uh, here's um, an information gap, simple um, activity um, a pre-intermediate level uh, from uh, in company. Uh, you can see speaker B's information, uh, speaker A has information about uh, Delia, and uh, students simply have to complete the chart by asking questions, the, the, the type of questions that they've already been working on. So that's, that's a classic uh, kind of pair work exercise, um, but still very valuable, very useful. Uh, even if, again, you might say it's a little bit mechanical. But valuable practice for asking questions, which is always a, a difficult thing to do in English. Um, and so a slightly more open version of the information gap. Um, here, this is from the intermediate level of in-company. Um, each member of the, the pair has a little text to read, um, and it's conference advice, how to get the best out of attending conferences. Um, and then having read their, their piece, they have to summarize it and tell the partner what they've read. So that's a more, more open kind of pair work. Um, here's another example. It's one of my favorite uh, um, information gap activities. Um, it's a Paul Emerson activity. So. Uh, uh, Lots of you will be able to, to hear Paul talking uh, uh, after this session. Um, it's a negotiation activity. Uh, and um, negotiation, in fact, is, is by definition, is a, an information gap. Um, each person involved in the negotiation has their own information and their own agenda. And the goal of the negotiation is to, to close that gap uh, both in terms of exchanging information uh, and in terms of reaching an agreement, uh, bringing the, the two sides together. So this is this is a great activity. I think almost all negotiation activities, uh, in my experience, produce a lot of language. Um, so not everybody has to negotiate uh, in their job, um, but actually when you think about it, um, just getting somebody to agree to adopt a new procedure or to a work arrangement um, is a negotiation. So it is actually something that uh, that lots of people need to do. So this is a nice one. Um, you may have used this exercise in the past from the, the back of the, the teacher's book uh, for in company. Um, now you can find all this uh, online. Uh, with the, the third edition of In Company, uh, you have lots of online resources, including uh, all these worksheets, uh, which are very precious. So, um, another thing to think about is whether your learners are in-service learners or pre-service learners. Are they people who are already in work, uh, probably working in a company, or are they students in a business school 
uh, or uh, a university um, who don't yet have very much experience of business. So, would you like to address this question? Uh, you can't talk about business if you've never had a job. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Or does it depend? So we've got uh, we've got some answers coming in here. Um, perhaps not as many answers. Well, not nearly as many answers as we have people in the room. So um, hmm, I'm going to I'm going to assume that that means that people are thinking about the question and probably saying, well, yeah, it depends. Um, and I think it depends is is usually a good answer certainly a nice answer in the language classroom uh, because you can always ask why. What does it depend on uh, what's different in different situations? Um, it does depend, um, but the key idea here, I think, is um, exploiting different, uh, uh, different areas. Within service people, you can exploit their experience get them to talk about um, how they've dealt with a particular problem or a particular situation. Uh, with pre-service learners, um, they may not have much experience, but they certainly do have opinions. And if you can relate the situation to uh, experiences they have had their everyday life, um, they will have lots of opinions. So here are a couple of examples. The first one, handling calls, uh, comes from in company, which is designed for in service learners. And certainly, these type of questions um, you can't really answer if you haven't uh, already done a job. What percentage of your time at work do you spend on the phone? How many of the calls you make and receive are essential? Okay, so if you're teaching in a university or a business school, um, that probably won't be very productive unless perhaps people have done holiday jobs, uh, but it's really designed for, for people who are in work at the moment. Uh, the second example is targeting more um, pre-service learners, and um, it's from the business, uh, pre-intermediate, um, and the topic is cutting costs. Um, obviously, these students don't have any experience of managing a budget, cutting costs in business, but they're students, so they have um, experience and plenty of opinions uh, about how to manage their own student budgets. Uh, so this is just a, a mini case study uh, about a student situation um, and how to manage uh, any excess uh, in her budget uh, or how to manage if she runs out of uh, money uh, before the end of the year. Um, so the point I'm making is just to target your learners um, depending on whether you can rely more on experience or, or on opinions. So my seventh question for you. Um, talking business or talking about business? Um, I often hear teachers who say, I can teach my students all the business English they need by talking about their jobs and discussing newspaper articles. I don't need a course book. Uh, I can just get them to tell me what they do um, and I can bring in articles uh, from magazines, newspapers, and that provides plenty of business English. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Or do you think it depends? So not many people who agree. Um, lots of people who say it depends. And even more people who say, I disagree. Um, 
Sure. Um, as in, in any situation, it does depend. Um, but uh, I think what is important here is to remember that talking about business is not the same as talking business. Um, getting students to talk about their job is very useful, but that's talking about business. Um, and the kind of language that we have here in this activity, the sort of functional language uh, that you'll have in a typical business situation in a restaurant, um, you don't get that language. Talking, talking about the job or reading an article doesn't produce that language. Um, so obviously both are important. We need to talk about business, but we also need to talk business. So we need to um, get our students practicing the language, the functional language in particular that they need to, to interact. And this means role playing, basically. Um, I have a colleague who hates role play, um, and I tend to disagree with him and try very hard to persuade him that role play is really, really essential. Uh, otherwise, it's very difficult to, to practice this, um, this functional language that, that is very important. So um, this kind of activity, uh, I think, is, is very productive and is also usually a lot of fun. Uh, um, here's another example. Um, this is from in company upper intermediate. Um, the new management scenarios, um, which include video. And of course, video is a very nice way to make that functional language really, really visible. Uh, it's it's a nice way to allow students to identify with a situation. Um, uh, and it's very easy for them to, to put themselves uh, in, that, uh, in that situation and uh, use the language in a, in a realistic way. So if you haven't already had a look at those videos, do, uh, do have a look at them. They're, they're, they're very nice to use, uh, and they produce a a lot of language, a lot of reaction uh, from the, the students. So uh, here's another question for you. Um, most students prefer A, talking about language rules and vocabulary, B, doing language exercises and texts, or C, using the language to solve a problem. Let's hear your opinions on that. Okay, we've got lots of answers coming in very quickly. And I think we have a, a pretty clear uh, majority of C's, but but also some Bs, and of course there are those students who like talking about language rules and vocabulary. Uh, they're probably a, a minority, but, but there are some, and uh, so obviously we need to adjust uh, to those students uh, if, if that's what they, what they want and what they need. Um, doing language exercises and texts, uh, uh, yeah, there's, there's a place for that, um, but I think probably uh, the majority of students, um, and yeah, we're getting comments, uh, and obviously I'd agree with this, that this is more so uh, as you move up the levels to advanced levels. Um, problem solving at elementary level is, is limited. It's possible, uh, but it's limited. Um, but yes, I think uh, this is a very motivating way of using the language. Um, so task-based learning uh, is something which tends to be successful and really gets students to talk. Um, so um, a couple of examples, um, problem solving, decision making activities. Um, this is again from in company uh, upper intermediate. Uh, it's um, a, 
a people skills um, unit um, and culminating in a meeting role play um, with an agenda to work through, uh, as you can see uh, at the bottom of the page, um, with decisions to make, um, policy and guidelines uh, for different aspects of uh, office life. Um, any activity where you have an agenda to work through tends to be helpful to, to have a structure uh, rather than a loose discussion uh, so if students can actually work through that agenda and make decisions uh, that's usually very productive. Uh, here's another example of a decision making activity, um, a meeting framework where students have decisions to make uh, on different points, uh, different questions. Uh, um, and again, this is um, from the teacher resources, which are now available online. Um, used to be in the old uh, teacher's books, but uh, now it's all nicely online, so very easy, handy to download where and when you need it. And that's also true of the case studies, um, which in in the second edition of In Company were in the book. Um, they've now been moved uh, onto the website, but they're still there. And a nice activity like a, a SWOT analysis, uh, again, is a, is a classic uh, discussion activity in Business English, talking about the strengths and weaknesses, the opportunities and threats that a company faces is, is usually very productive um, and pretty realistic because um, People do still use this tool uh, quite often uh, in their work. So task-based learning. Um, this is my penultimate question, you might be pleased to know. Uh, so talking about presentations and pictures. Um, one of my principles is if all else fails, get students to talk about themselves. Most people love talking about themselves, uh, about their work, uh, about their interests, about their hobbies. Um, so presentations are, are something which are, are nice to include in, in any business English course, even if it's not a, a specific objective of the course. So have a think about this question. What's the ideal length for a classroom presentation? Two to three minutes, five to ten minutes, 20 to 30 minutes. And as your answers come in, uh, I think uh, they're changing a little bit. Uh, uh, lots of A's and B's, um, not so many C's. Uh, <laughs> it depends, of course, yeah, uh, and depends on the size of your class in particular. Uh, if you've got a, a class of uh, 12 or 15, uh, then it's going to be pretty tough to give everybody a 20 or 30 minute presentation. If you've got a very small class of two or three people, well, maybe you can do that. Yeah, and of course, it depends on the levels. Okay, so majority of people are saying um, B, five to ten minutes. Yeah, actually, um, after after some well, after quite a few years of experience, um, um, and particularly um, videoing um, students' presentation, um, um, video is very useful, but um, it, it's pretty difficult to to do feed feedback on video. Uh, in a, in a way that doesn't quickly get boring. Um, so I'd actually go for A, um, starting with two to three minutes. Um, in a two, and three, two to three minute pitch, you can illustrate um, a lot of the, uh, the, the language uh, points that you might want to work on, um, structuring the presentation, signposting it, uh, using uh, the expressions to transition from one idea to another um, and all the areas like body language, um, how a person looks, uh, how they use their voice, 
those come come over very well in in two or three minutes. Um, two or three minutes is not too um, frightening for students to to think about and to prepare, um, and it's a it's a good way to start. You may find that after that you want to move on to to longer presentations, um, but I suggest um, start with a very short. Uh, two-minute presentation, and you'll be surprised um, how much mileage you get out of that. Um, and of course, a, a two or three-minute presentation will very often trigger um, at least five or ten minutes of questions and discussion. Um, so again, that, that can be very productive. Some people are disagreeing with me. Well, that's great. Disagreement is good, especially in the language classroom. So. Uh, I'm happy to disagree occasionally. Now, what I do find is is very useful is to have a model. Uh, it's quite difficult to ask students suddenly just to to make a two-minute presentation about uh, their work, about what they're doing at the moment, uh, about their uh, plans for the future, uh, about their career uh, objectives. But if you can show them um, a model and preferably a nice video model uh, like this one. Um, from um, in company pre-intermediate. These are short presentations um, by well-known business people um, with a simple structure, uh, and it really stimulates them. Uh, first of all, they watch it and they think, yeah, OK, that's, that's clear, that's easy. Yeah, it goes out of the way you 